let go and make sure we have a nice energy to listen to the talk of David Stapples. Well, I don't know whether I, des I deserve that form of uh, um, uh, acceptance, but, uh, but I'll try. And I certainly can't beat kicking a glass of water off the stage. <laughs> that, that's particularly good. Um, my background is, is well, it's most of it's on there. I used to, uh, I used to be, uh, work for the government in, in uh, government surveillance. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah. and Hughes Aircraft Corporation, um, uh, and now I'm a professor at City University working in uh, engineering and in cyber security. So that's my background. Here is the talk. Is it possible to cyberjack modern aeroplanes? Well, I'm going to give my own answer to this at the end uh, and uh, going to provide you with all the evidence that you can actually form up and say whether you believe me or not. But uh, what we're going to do is because it's quite the aircraft systems are quite technical you'll have to bear with me a little bit that I'm going to go through some of the technical parts of an aircraft um, and explain a little bit about how the systems are put together um, you have to excuse me because a couple of the slides are busy but you've got them in your pack anyway and I'm, I'm sure when you go to bed tonight just before you go to sleep you'll have them out studying them it will be the most interesting thing you've done today except listen to those lovely ladies this morning um, so, is it possible to cyberjack modern aeroplanes? Well, did you hear the news yesterday that hackers from ISIL, or IS, or whatever they call themselves uh, these days, hacked into the Sony Corporation and into uh, uh, PlayStation um, and uh, uh, Xbox and destroyed some of the games that were playing? Now. Although that's a bit of a pain, it's not actually too bad. But what they did was the chairman of the Sony Corporation was flying from one city to another city in the States, and they made a threat to say that there was a bomb on that plane. So the aircraft had to divert immediately and uh, for a bomb search. Now, that was a physical bomb. What I'm going to introduce you now is to a cyber bomb. If there was a cyber bomb on that airplane, what damage could it do? Or could I just hijack an aeroplane? So that's really what I'm going to talk about. Um, and what I really want to do is, uh, to put it in, into context, and, and forgive me for those people from Malaysia, I'm actually going to talk about the disappearance of Malaysian uh, MH370, mainly because I need an aircraft to, to um, pin my, my philosophy against. So, so uh, we'll have a look what really happened to that aircraft and then look at some of the, the uh, outrageous stories that were appearing about what everyone else thought happened to that aircraft. So um, we'll have a look at that. Then, once we've done that, we can then have a look at the, the aircraft systems themselves and I can explain to you that that these systems, although they, they, d they control an aircraft in every way, they control from its navigation, etc., 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 they actually look like a corporate system, or they're beginning to look like corporate systems. And if you can hack a corporate system, you can certainly hack an aircraft. So that's where I'm going. Um, and uh, uh, we can then have a look at some of the things, that, or some of the, the, the ways that we can stop that happening. But you, you, you then have to believe whether it's really happening. Then we'll have a look at the, the cyber threats aircraft themselves and then we'll mitigate some of those threats and then I'll come up with some of the research that we're doing uh, to uh, look at infrastructure or very complex infrastructure and how we can protect that but that way will also protect our aircraft as well so that's where we're going to end up and I'll answer my question at the end so modern airliners are well in there in the digital age now they, they have fly-by-wire and we'll explain that in a moment uh, digital communications, computer control, uh, and in the very near future, you heard this morning about connecting to everything on the internet. Well, this is going to happen in aircraft. You're going to be sitting in the back of the aircraft there with your display in the back of the, the, um, uh, the seat in front of you, and you'll be able to connect to everything on the internet. There'll be apps coming up for you to play with. There'll be games, etc., etc., which, of course, they'll charge you for. Um, and uh, so therefore, what we're going to do is we're connecting this aeroplane to the internet 
open internet. We're also connecting it to all of its communication systems, and it begins to look like uh, something that we've got on Earth. So, uh, like our terrestrial existence, we're living with malware. We all live with it, don't we? I I'm sure you've received the scams, you know. My uncle has left me five million pounds, I need a bank account to put it into, you know. Uh, Etc. We've all, we've all seen those, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And my wife wonders why she's getting Viagra adverts. Um, but but the the um, these are all coming through as uh, scams that we are used to. In an aircraft system, which is a complex computer system, can it handle the scam? And that's really what what I need to 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 bring out. But also, it's scams. But we're talking about malware from criminals, terrorists, opportunity opportunist hackers, and the consequences are actually quite dire of what can happen here. But also, we could talk about state terrorism, can't we? Uh, and at the end, what I'll do is I'll introduce you to Stuxnet um, uh, again, um, and then explain perhaps how state was involved in that. So my conclusion, we must become much more conscious of, of the, the threat we are, uh, we, uh, and we must design recovery uh, into mission critical systems from the outset. So that's where I'm going. Um, let's let's go on the journey there now. Right, Malaysian uh, 370. Well, we heard the last well the last voice message was at 0119 local time, 8th of March, en route to Beijing. Shortly after this message, this voice message was received, the aircraft disappeared from radar. Um, and. Uh, but everyone thought it had crashed in the South China or the Bay of Thailand. Uh, everyone thought it had crashed there, and when I got the information through, I was waiting for them to say, yes, we found wreckage, etc. Uh, but nothing happened. Do you, do you, you remember two hours later, it came out to say, it hasn't crashed. The other radar has seen it flying uh, west over northern part of Malaysia, south of Langkawi, um, and out into the Andaman Sea. Now, you could then turn around and say, well, has that been hijacked? Well, if it had been hijacked, then it happened because somebody knew what they were doing. Because what they did, they switched off, first of all, the transponder, which was the, the aircraft's way of saying to the radar on the ground, here I am, this is my identity, this is my height, this is the course I'm on, and this is my speed. And of course, that can be displayed for the air traffic controllers. And that's called secondary radar. It's very accurate. It's accurate to about ten, every, about ten meters, um, and uh, that was switched off. But prior to that, the system that was on board the aircraft that reports its condition was also switched off, and it's called ACARS. We'll, we'll go through it in a moment. Uh, that was switched off as well. So that was switched off first, then the secondary radar, and then the aircraft flew on to um, um, uh, disappear, and. Courtesy of the BBC, uh, this is what it what it looked like. Its flight as it came out, flying uh, northeast uh, over over uh, Malaysia itself, um, out of Co just about there will be Koko Baru. I'm sure you Malaysian people would know that, um, and uh, there at the where the black square is, it basically disappeared. Then the military, some days later. Uh, admitted that they'd had it on radar going on the dotted line there, etc. So it made a course change west, a course change northeast again, a course, course change uh, uh, northwest, and then as it got out north of the Andaman Sea, but north of the island of Sumatra, it then uh, transpired that it flew uh, south. And the reason that we know that is because the, the GPS on board, like just like the GPS on your car, the GPS on board communicates with the satellites um, above the Indian Ocean just to get its position. Um, and every hour, it will handshake with the satellite. The satellite will say, are you still there? And the aircraft said, yes, I'm still here. So we know it went, went that way. By analyzing the signal itself uh, and the frequency change in the signal called Doppler shift, we know that it flew south. Uh, and it would have ended up uh, not here as the, uh, where the de it wasn't debris from the aircraft, but it would have ended up somewhere around that, that point there, not been found yet. However, this is only to set the scene for you. you you've all heard this, you've all read the story, and we're all fascinated, and we'll find it one day. 
But the scene is this. All the conspiracy theories that came out from the, well, the people around the world. The aircraft was shot down by a foreign power using an American modified missile system. The aircraft was hijacked by a person or persons unknown and flown to a remote location. In this case, uh, Diego Garcia, uh, which is in the middle of the Indian Ocean. And the Americans did this because they wanted to hide the aircraft from everybody. Whatever they did with the 200 and odd people on board, 240 people, <laughs> how do you hide 240 people? How do you stop them saying, hey, we're here? Um, uh, the aircraft was remotely controlled using implanted malware and flown to an unknown uh, location. And it got me thinking afterwards by looking at these uh, um, three uh, conspiracy theories that the last one is it, well, we know this one's possible because it's happened. Uh, and we, <laughs> we also know. Uh, an aircraft has been shot down by a missile, unfortunately, very recently, so uh, it's, uh, that's very sad. Um, it wasn't an American missile, though. Uh, so I thought, I want to have a look at that, and so I started to, to, to study it in, in, in a fair bit of detail. Well, as I said to you before, the aircraft have changed over the years. That top line there, there's the pilot's control system column. They called it the yoke, yeah. It was connected by wires and chains and, and cables, etc., through pulleys all the way down to flying surfaces, you know, the ailerons or the e elevators, etc. And so therefore this happened. Um, and uh, we could even put in here the feel for the pilot. So therefore, it f when he pulls back the column and the aircraft starts to climb, it, it feels um, uh, that he's pulling it back. So that all that feel was put into it. We could also feed back coupling devices to make certain, and, and hydraulic devices, because big airliners, you still need some hydraulics to do this. So that's what it was like. So you can imagine the weight, can't you? And if any of those cables ever snapped, there's only one of them, the aircraft's going to crash. Uh, and so therefore, have, have a nasty accident anyway. Uh, so, early in this 1970s, military aircraft decided that they want to actually have a computer to fly the aeroplane. And the, uh, the first aircraft to do that was an American fighter called the F-117. The reason being that nobody could fly it. It was absolutely impossible to fly this aeroplane. It was uncontrollable because it was unstable. So the only thing that could keep it flying was a computer. So that's what they brought this in for. And the pilot flew the computer. The computer fl fl flies the aircraft. Uh, in the 1990s, with certainly with the Airbus A320, that became reality in airliners, and also the Boeing 777, which we're talking about. This beca that became reality. Now the pilot flies this. The autopilot also can control this, etc., etc., and this controls the plane. There's no wires, no backup system, and so therefore, if we can impact this in some way, uh, you can see the damage we, we could cause. You, you, you would agree with that, wouldn't you? It's a it's not a single system, so let's not, let, 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 those computers are triplicated, so it's not quite so worrying. Um, but <coughs> everything worked quite normally. The computer would then come down to the flying surface, the elevator, then I'd have an aircraft response, etc. It's going up or down or to the side, to, to left or right, and it would come back to the computer. The pilot's now tired. He then hands it over to the, 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 um, um, the autopilot, and it flies the computer now. To, to wherever he's going. So that was the, the, the philosophy uh, of what happened. This is what I want you to study tonight. This is what my, stu you know, my students at this stage will then turn around and say, ah, I now know where the exam questions are coming. It's the difficult diagram that I don't explain properly. But all I'm trying to do here is to say this is really the autopilot of the A330 airliner, and it has Computers, 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 etc., cetera, etc., cetera, all linked together to actually fly this aeroplane. Uh, and also coming into here, we've then got outside information, 
from communication systems. From communication systems. This is the inertial navigation system, which then has GPS coming into it to actually tell you how to the, the fly the aircraft. So, so basically, this is a mixture of computing systems, but what it really is, is, is um, it's connected to the outside world. That's, that's the point I want to raise here. Um, and you can see the computer then flies, th these are the flying surfaces down here, the, the, um, uh, the elevators, uh, the rudder, et cetera, et cetera. And it also, the engine as well. Um, if you think about it, uh, think about your car now. The engine management system on a car is really complicated. And what it does is make certain that y your, control, your car is engine is controlled so it burns the least fuel for what it's doing. This is exactly what happens on aircraft as well. But uh, the point I want to raise here also is that did you know that engines of aeroplanes are not owned by the, the um, airline? Not most of them anyway. They're owned by Rolls-Royce or Pratt & Whitney or GE. Uh, and they're called fly by, the, fly by the hour. So as soon as the pilot puts his ignition key in, presses the starter button, he then has to put money into the meter to pay for the engine. But Rolls-Royce, of course, or GE or Pratt & Whitney, want to know that how well is our engine doing? So all the time the aircraft's flying, put the ignition key is turned on, the money's going into the meter, it's being fed back with information from the engine to the manufacturer, and the manufacturer is feeding information back to the engine <laughs> to make certain that it's, it's flying um, correctly. So here's a, can you see what I'm trying to say here is now? Here we've got big systems, but they're communicating with the outside world, exactly as we do with the internet. This is the cockpit, or the flight deck, of the A380. It's beginning now to look like your home computer, isn't it? keyboards <laughs> in front of the pilot. He flies with, a, with a, a little joystick beside him, just as you do with your, when you play your flight simulator game. Uh, all the, it's called a glass cockpit, mainly because everything is digital. So every, every item here is coming from digital displays, which are fed from the computer systems that are on the aircraft. Uh, and all the controls he's got here go back to the computer systems. And that really is, is you can set that up almost, can't you, on, in, in Flight Simulator these days. Um, and as Flight Simulator, whatever number version it's up to now, but goes out and it goes on to the, the uh, Xbox, which it will do very shortly, um, it's exactly the same flying condition as the aeroplane. Can you start seeing a side part here? Because if that is the flying part of the aircraft, any hacker gets hold of this, he could then start looking at what he can do with a flight w in a flight simulator to what he can do with an airliner. This here is the control, uh, is the, the, c the computer bay and avionics bay that sits below the cockpit. The pilot opens up a, um, a, a um, uh, trap door in his cockpit floor, climbs down the ladder, and all that lot is ben beneath him. So if I just return to this, that little bit at the top there, that hashed pa hatched part, that was the bit you just saw on the flight deck of the airliner. Here is a whole bank of computers, which then does his, uh, he can plan everything to by putting input into the computers, et cetera, navigation, performance, flight plans, management guidance, et cetera, et cetera. Here is the autopilot, and that's guiding the, um, uh, uh, the aircraft, but it's also taking in all of those external devices to actually fly that, help the computer fly the aeroplane. It also then controls Everything out, out external, it controls all the instruments, it controls all the flying surfaces. It sends information on the condition of the aeroplane back to the ground and receives information back. This bit here is just managing the rudder. And down here, this, this bit here manages the engine. So uh, that's what the systems look like. And of course, 
uh, into here I've got the condition of all my um, aircraft, GPS, and the inertial navigation system. I'm receiving all my navigation information into here, goes into here, into here, navigation coming in from there, etc., etc. And so therefore, the bank of computers then flies the aeroplane. So it's now looking like a company now, isn't it? A company computing system. Because this is, we've now got backbones, data buses, primary flight computers, auto, auto directors, air data resources, um, uh, flight computers, aircraft information systems, engine computers, all sitting there on buses. Uh, and they will communicate uh, through, the computer talks to each computer through a, a data bus. And because the data buses used to use copper wire and copper wire uses electricity, um, that's not good taking past fuel tanks. So what we've now done is the, the um, 787 plus the, 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 the new A350 of fiber optic all the way through. So now all my computers actually sit on fiber optic backbones. And the fiber optics themselves will be triplicated, not, not single. Uh, and all the computers themselves will be triplicated. And they have voting systems between the computers. So the computer will then say, uh, it's asked me to turn left at, with this amount of uh, um, movement. Um, do you agree with that? And the other two computers say, yep, we agree with that. <laughs> and so therefore it turns left. If one computer says no, the, the other two computers will say, okay, then we agree, so you're, you're the odd man out, and it shuts that computer down. So it's called a voting system. Uh, and so therefore, uh, not only do we have the, all this triplicated, we have all the computers, tripli or most of the computers triplicated, uh, and they themselves um, will have voting systems uh, to, to work. So you can now start seeing this is a hugely interactive system that's aboard the aeroplane. Copper cables are seven times the weight of fiber optics, um, so, and they require heavy shielding, of course. Um, so again, the reliability of optics are much better. So. Now I've got my computing system on board here. How does it communicate? Well, it's going to communicate with everything. While it's on the ground or just taking off from here, it's talking to secondary radars, it's talking to the organization that runs it, the business, etc. It's talking to air traffic control. As it goes into the air, it talks to satellites for just passing information backwards and forwards. It's talking to GPS satellites that are flying, uh, it passing information backwards and forwards. It's talking to uh, radio navigation uh, beacons, uh, aeronautical telephones, other radio links, et cetera, et cetera. And as it comes down to the other side, it's communicating with the airfield uh, and uh, all of the um, uh, facilities at that side. So the aircraft communicates the whole time it's powered up. So the, the moment the aircraft it comes, if you like, towed to the, out of the maintenance hall, as soon as it comes out of the maintenance, they've got to power up the systems. As soon as it starts powering up, it is communicating. So they connect it up to the, the jetway, it's communicating. The passengers get on board, it's communicating. It's flying, it's communicating all the time. So, so basically, I hope you can see now what's happening. We've got a... a um, uh, an internet system, really, haven't we? Yeah? It's just communicating like the rest of us on your, 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 your tablets, etc. Uh, except it's got a lot more communication ports it's dealing with. Just wanted a couple of touch on a couple of really important communications. This goes back to MH370 now. As I said to you before, uh, the Aircraft Communications Addressing and Reporting System, ACARS, reports everything that goes on in the aeroplane. So if, if a pilot switches something off, uh, the microwave system fails because of the, you know, they're cooking something, uh, the toilets fail, uh, are, are get clogged up, engines have a problem, avionics have a problem, it is reported. 
But even if it's nothing happens with the aircraft, it's still reporting every 30 minutes by saying, nothing's happening, we're bored. And then as soon as something happens on the aircraft, it communicates. It communicates with the ground via satellite, via normal communications. It then goes back to the manufacturers, to the organization uh, that runs the airplane, like Malaysian in this particular case, uh, and they will communicate back with the aircraft. A system that was on MH370 but not being used was this one. And what this does is that the Remember the aircraft knows where it is. On the ground, you know approximately where it is, but the aircraft knows exactly where it is, down to probably about 10 centimeters at any one time. It's really, really accurate. So therefore, if the aircraft don't knows where it is, it could tell all the other aircraft around it, hey, I'm here, guys. And of course, those aircraft also tell him where he is. So therefore, the pilot on that little display has a picture of everything in the airspace around him. He knows exactly, or she knows exactly, where he is, she is, and every other aeroplane is. But so does the ground, because it's communicated to the ground as well. So the ground know everything about the aircraft, etc., where it is. So what we've now got is this network connecting up my conditioning, and this network connecting everything up about my position. So these two are working all the time. They're communicating uh, uh, virtually every second. Um, and so therefore, we've got this, this ability. And as I said to you before, the, the ADS-B um, was on Malaysian 370, but it wasn't being used. Um. Ah, we have more communication. I can communicate through a network which actually sends up text messages or, or messages to the, the computer just from people on the ground. Real-time operations management in the airline. Dealing with problems in flight, the engineers. Assessing safety issues. Dealing with important admin matters. You know, one of your passengers on board has is, is, uh, is got a, uh, a relation that's died. You know, please look after her or him, etc. External clients can get important messages. Now, what we've got is a yet more systems communicating through uptime repositories, through satellites or communications, into data transmissions, and then into the, the cockpit. Uh, and I have more communications existing on the aeroplane. And finally, passengers are bored. So they want to be connected to everything. So here we have every single app that the passenger, well, not the passenger, it's the one the airline's going to sell you, you know, for hire. You know, remember, of course, that the tickets, ticket price is, is virtually nothing these days. It's at $100 for a, a trip there and everywhere. So, yeah, so they say $100 for a single seat, um, no food, um, only hand baggage, and everything else you pay for. They'll even put money on the toilet soon. So, this is where they make money. Food, carry on, baggage that goes into the hold, but this is going to be the real money earner. So now what we've got is my airliner connected through to most things on the internet through its communication systems, because I can't put special communication systems on board to do this. It has to go out through the normal communication systems that are on board. So I, I, now I have other um, uh, issues. And it now starts looking like there's the hacker, there's the internet. He's just, this is just another uh, server on the internet, isn't it? And sitting on the server, I have a whole bunch of aircraft sitting on the other end. Uh, and that's uh, what how the hacker may see the, the, uh, the internet as it comes up and many experts believe that this will be near impossible as the perpetrator would need to understand fully the architecture and operation of a fully integrated multiprocessor control system. Lord Kelvin in 1895, I can state flatly that heavier than air machines are impossible. Eight years later, the Wright brothers took off an aeroplane. 
So do you believe the first statement? Because that's really important. So here's my in-flight entertainment system now. All in the back of the seats, I have or I will have uh, uh, displays where you can watch films. And of course, you'll be able to select films when you and select whatever you want to do. So there'll be keyboards coming up eventually. Uh, people will want to connect their, their iPhones uh, and their iPads um, up to uh, an IFE server. But how does the IFE server get all its information? Well, when it comes into the ground through a jet gateway, it will connect, connect to the internet it will connect through to the aircraft operator, and they would load the films down for that particular flight. Digital films, digital adverts, etc., etc. So it's connected up there. When the aircraft is flying, as I said before, this lot can now be connected up through the aircraft's communication systems uh, out uh, to uh, the outside world. So uh, this is just the IFE um, as, as it's uh, generally connected today. Boeing, who make 747, 787, 777, 737s, etc., are thinking that it's so complicated to test these aircraft systems out. They want the maintenance technicians to have iPads. So the, all the information on the iPad, uh, all the information they need to do their test will come up on the iPad and they'll get the results. Now, Boeing haven't said what I'm just about to say, so uh, I'm making this bit up. What happens when we say, OK, then, now we've got that, why not connect the iPad through Wi-Fi through to the automatic test equipment? Now what we've done is we allow this lady here uh, with this, this device to, in fact, uh, not only look through the tests sh she or she has to do, but get results back from the tests, and they say the aircraft is serviceable or not serviceable. It's not a, not a great step, is it, forward from there? Um, So, just moving on to my next bit, control may not be a criminal or terrorist focus. Extortion with the threat of an aircraft destruction through catastrophic system interface. Well, we're seeing this all the time at the moment, isn't we? It's called ransomware. It's coming onto the computer. It then encrypts your files. They phone you up or send you an email saying, unless you pay a ransom of $3,000, $100,000 or whatever it is, we're just going to wipe your disk clean, wipe all your memory. We will not give you the encryption codes. And what ba basically, this has been on long enough for it to do the backup encryptions as well. So all the backups are, are, are encrypted. Uh, if you don't pay the money, it, you don't get it. It happened two days ago or three days ago in, in California, this time with uh, Android um, uh, iPhones. Uh, people had to pay $100 to have the encryption code uh, information, the, the password put in, so they could unlock their telephones. Ransomware. So what would happen now with the Sony uh, s executive who was flying, unless you pay up whatever it is, we're just going to blow your, uh, the aircraft out of the sky, or we're going to cause a cyber problem. And from what I've told you so far, you can see, can't you, that I can get malware to cause a problem with the aircraft. It could also force the flight deck crew to fly to another destination uh, with the threat of aircraft destruction um, or a straight destruction because, uh, um, and then we advertise it and say we destroyed the aircraft. So we, if, if it's a terrorist group, that's what they can do. So you say, that's not possible, OK. The representation in Amsterdam in, in uh, April 2013, just a year ago, demonstrated that it was possible to take control of an aircraft flight systems and communication using an Android smartphone. It was actually demonstrated at the conference. Uh, the FAA said it wasn't. Actually, I. I was there, and the FAA weren't there. So it, it really quite... I can see why they would say that, though. In 2008, a Spanair uh, flight 
5022 crashed just after takeoff. 154 people died. It happened because there was a Trojan horse loaded into the control and reporting software of the aircraft. Whether it was by intent, I don't know. It may have just picked up a, 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 a piece of malware, but it, it certainly happened. In 2008, the FAA reported a computer network in the 787. Uh, what they said was the IFE, the in-flight entertainment system, was too close to the um, systems uh, on the aircraft. There was a, a direct path between them. Uh, and Boeing apparently have addressed that issue. I haven't seen what they've done, but, they, but they've certainly addressed it. Um, linked to the first one there, a researcher spent three years investigating and understanding the flaws in a standard management system he bought from eBay. The software that was on the standard system was exactly the same software that was in the aircraft. And we've seen that, haven't we? Because the pilot of the Boeing 777 of MH370 had at home a flight simulator, which was a perfect replica of a Boeing 777. So he managed to get hold of all the systems plus all the software, connect them all up to work as a flight simulator, uh, and um, be able to, to uh, well, I don't know what he was doing with it, but, but either training or, or whatever. But anyway, he was certainly doing something with it. But he managed to do that. So what are the vulnerabilities then? Well, any link between the passenger business entertainment uh, systems and the aircraft flight and control communications nerve system. You agree with that? Any link between those is a weakness on the aircraft. Any radio link between passenger-owned devices and the aircraft's communication system. What would happen if I took a, a, a mobile phone on board that didn't have the frequencies of the mobile phone but now operated at the same frequency as the GPS system? And I fed the GPS coordinates into the aircraft's um, uh, communications. And I'm a lot closer to the aircraft than the satellite. So my signal is going is to become uh, predominant. I could put the wrong coordinates in. So there's another weakness. External radio data links uh, to the aircraft. Uh, well, these are all the nav, nav aids, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, external physical data links to the aircraft when the aircraft checks up the jetway or the gat links. Uh, Aircraft access to equipment bays, uh, sorry, air crew access. If you can go down into the equipment bay, I can put a USB stick in, can't I? And load the software. Um, we're well, not going to go through them all, but of these, the employee will always be pr present, be the greatest threat, as there are better, and this is no, now from my research, 70% chance that malware can be loaded. Everybody thousands of people were taking Stuxnet to their computers at work, plugging in their USBs. Stuxnet would look in there and say, hey, this is not a Siemens uh, a controller for um, a, 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 a centrifuge. So therefore, it'd wipe itself out. As soon as it found those centrifuges, it says, right. And then it started to then alter the speeds of them, et cetera, et cetera. So if this could get through to one plant in... Um, uh, in Iran, what's the chances that I can get this through to hundreds and hundreds of airlines around the world? To respond to my questions, is it possible to cyberjack modern airplanes? Yes, but very difficult to achieve if it's not a cyber bomb. But we do need to be much, make it much, much more difficult. Was MH370 cyberjacked? I don't believe so. I think it was. It was as it there's too much evidence to go the other way, but I'm stronger. I have stronger opinions about um, number one. Thank you. <laughs> ah, one 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 final bit. I must tell you this. It just just this came out from the Cyber Hackers Conference. What they did was then say to all the hackers there, "Do you believe you'll ever be caught?" 80% said no. What motivates you? Fun. But more importantly, this last question, 
what would make it difficult for you to get onto a system? If people had proper authentication codes, proper passwords, and operated with staff that could be trusted. So that comes back to my point on the maintenance technicians. This came out from a, from a um, conference held in California uh, last week. And here's the, if anybody wants this the particular survey, I'll send it to, to the, the organizer and the survey will come out. Thank you. How is it that the airline companies and the Boeings and the et cetera wouldn't address these on their own? I mean, they must have brilliant people on staff who would also identify these kind of things. And the, the, what you pointed out, especially relating to uh, inside jobs, rogue employees, insiders, we know in the literature from other areas that insiders, rogue employees are responsible for the majority of certain types of data breaches and other things. Surely there must be ways through encryption of the data or whatever, that these issues, at least the ones you've identified so clearly, could be addressed, and why aren't they? I mean, it's, it's baffling to me. What are they doing about it? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I share your, your, your views. Uh, uh, yes, I think they are being addressed. I haven't really gone through all of the things that Boeing and Airbus are doing, uh, and they are certainly aware of it. And ICAO, who are the international authority for, for um, air travel, or not air travel, air airlines, aircraft. Um, they are uh, um, addressing it as well. They're becoming much, much more aware of this. Um, and uh, they're certainly putting in a lot of um, uh, protection. But my worry is, is that uh, they're behind the curve. Um, and the, ha the hackers, and what we haven't employed on here, of course, are the, the hackers that are state employed and they are the best hackers in the world. Um, and uh, would they cause any damage like this? Uh, uh, who, who knows? But I, I think that th it is being thought of, and the research we're doing, which is on recoverable com computers, hopefully will, be, will help a lot. W then we can ig not ignore malware, but we can then turn around and say, well, if it happens, at least we can keep the aircraft safe. Yeah. But uh, we, so we can't take away uh, uh, your concrete anxiety, no, no. we can't take it all away because uh, technically you would say it is possible, but it's really hard. It's, it's, it's really hard. So this also makes that we, we, were, uh, we as passengers, I guess a lot of people flew in for the conference. Uh, we should almost be demanding uh, the, the most uh, sophisticated updates to these systems to, to gu guarantee our most safety in the air. I only fly on old aeroplanes now. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> I only fly on old aeroplanes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no. I, I think that the the um, uh, it's the employees is is the what that's the weak link. Uh, for a hacker to get through these communication systems, they're going to have to be really good, uh, and have to know a lot about the computing on board and how it all works, etc. But those people are around. Uh, it, the life is is such a wonderful thing that every day I always meet someone cleverer than I am. It really humbles your soul. Stand up, and we're going to. Yeah. Sorry, I just mean to say what you said about the inside jobs, the employees who are employed. That's the biggest, yes. maybe not the biggest threat, but enormously. Oh, it's the biggest. Uh, significant in other areas, and surely that they should be able to find ways to address because of the enormous threat potential. I look to the HR and the psychologist actually who employ these people to turn around and, and, and first of all uh, be able to identify things like that, and also to keep employees happy. I think that's really important. Because yeah. I guess employees, uh, us as a human, they are the, the, the most difficult uh, pieces of the system to, uh, to secure, right? Because yeah. you can't just shut us down with a code or, uh, uh, or a firewall. Where, uh, this nice is, though, this is where the emotion yeah. uh, uh, yeah. becomes a threat, yeah.